Hey, Senda. Hey, Phil. Uh, do you want to chit chat tonight? I would love to chit chat yeah, again. Because I, I, I think you don't have anything else <laughs> to go, right? No. No, no. No. So, uh, cue music. <laughs> And welcome to another episode of Pandas Talking Games. I'm your host who was on the road all day, Phil. And I am your host who was not on the road all day, Senda. That was yeah. the opposite, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, we're doing a chit chat episode tonight. Uh, largely because I was on the road this weekend because I took a um, small trip. For those, don't panic. I traveled only to Connecticut, which is um, in New York State, considered a safe uh, state, and uh, only to go see my parents. So nothing adventurous. Uh, very carefully discussed about, you know, merging bubbles. Um, but it was nice um, to uh, it was nice to go somewhere else other than the place I've been for five months, four months. No, mm-hmm. what? Time mean time is meaningless. I don't um, know since since March, March for you. Yeah, and I hadn't seen my parents since January. They had um, they had come up at the end of January, but I hadn't seen them since. Um, which is fine because my parents like <laughs> my parents live in their own little tiny bubble to begin with before pandemic. Um, so um, merging bubbles temporarily was actually pretty easy, and um, yeah, I mean it was just a matter. It was just like a lot of sitting around. Um, not doing stuff, uh, watching <laughs> TV. It was, I have mixed feelings about it. <laughs> I, have, I can hear that. I have mixed feelings about it because I, when I take days off from work, like I'm like, I would like to like sit and read in quiet, make some delicious foods, like whatever. I go to my parents and it's like, I'm the last person who gets to make a decision about what to do, which also grates on my, um, grates on my, you know, take charge personality um i have to be very not take charge because it's my parents house and that is just messy for me to begin with um so anyway i did some reading um i did a bunch of relaxing um watch some tv and stuff like that so anyway it was unplugged from i was unplugged from school and i was in the verdant hills of connecticut um very green i i normally visit my parents at thanksgiving so it's it tends not to be very green or sometimes I visit them on like, you know, coming out of either going down to or coming back from Metatopia, which is like end of October when it's like very um, orange, right? Yellow and orange. But um, dead of summer, it is green as hell out there. Like it is li- it's like it's like indoor green. Like, <laughs> yeah, which is funny to me because like I'm at the part of the summer where um, because I, I, so I obey the watering restrictions in Denver, both because it's the right thing to do. And also because water is freaking expensive out let, here let during me be the clear. summer. As the developer of hydro hackers, yeah. I would be very disappointed if you were not being, um, conservative about your water. Oh, I always, I always am. But this is the time of year that the water restrictions, like the amount of time that you can water and the amount of days that you can water your lawn in Denver is not actually enough to keep you in a green verdant lawn. So you can tell who's not actually following them because they have crisp, lush green lawns. That is not my lawn right now. My lawn is like just this side of dead. Like it's mostly sort of greenish. Lawns are overrated. I mean, so I've been thinking about this a bunch, actually, and if I weren't on furloughs so that I actually had some more money to spend, um, I keep thinking that what I should do is that um, when I reseed it in the fall, which I haven't done in like five years, but whatever, you know, in theory, when I reseed it in the fall, I should be reseeding it with native grasses, right? Like, why? Why am I trying to grow this like grass mm-hmm. that like flourishes in wet places? This isn't a wet place. Why grass, are we doing that? That grass is like for here. Yeah. So like why? So I keep thinking about 
just getting um, native grass seeds and stuff and like I think tackling cool. that sucker. Yeah, I think it would be a much better idea, but like you have to hunt them down. <laughs> like it's not super easy to find. It's interesting um, because in other in other places south of you, um, Vegas, Utah, and things like that, uh, in Arizona, you get a tax break if you get rid of your um, water drinking lawn and get like a and get like a water conservative lawn. Yeah. Like I think if I'm trying to remember, I think somebody told me like in Arizona, if you obliterate your lawn and like pave it or just put like stones and sand or what on it, you get like a break from the city. Like, hey, thank you for you know, <laughs> thank you for not using water. Yeah. So I don't, I wouldn't get, I wouldn't get any tax breaks or actual like money breaks from the city or anything like that. But it wouldn't cost me a hundred and fifty dollars a month in water bill to have Hell a lawn. Yeah. I mean, that's like, that's okay. what we're, we're talking about here, just to be clear. Anyway, seven minutes in, we got distracted. <laughs> it's a chit-chat episode. It's a chit-chat. We're chit-chatting. We're chitting um, the chat, chatting so, the chit. Just to really, uh, really quick, um, if you've somehow picked this up as one of your first episodes, um, our chit-chat episodes are a more relaxed format. Uh, we've been doing a bunch of them during pandemic lockdown, but we actually went back a couple weeks ago and started just doing uh, some freeform uh, gaming topic discussions, uh, which we like, and we'll actually keep doing those too. Um, but our chit chat episodes are especially um, non structured, and we really just kind of talk about things that are giving us life, right? To, to quote the Gauntlet community. Um, we are going to talk about uh, gaming th- a gaming thing that's giving us life and then something else. Which is almost always food related, and is going to be food. To be that way, <laughs> it's, it's going to be food related, related tonight to that. too. Yeah. Um, that is also giving us life, um, and so we're just going to talk about those things, and then wrap up the show. And then next week we'll probably pull another topic uh, if the whim hits us. But in the meantime, we're just going to sit back and relax. We're going to chit. We're going to chat, and um, we're going to go make this happen. And to be perfectly clear, as you may have already noticed, these chit chats are unedited. I am not going to edit all of this nonsense out of the chit chat. My apologies. Please enjoy. <laughs> Hang on for I the ride. I think we're delightful on that. We are delightful. People on iTunes say that we have chemistry, but of course they said that when I edited the shows. <laughs> yeah, they didn't say that you we they didn't say like I mean, no offense, I think your editing is pretty pretty exceptional. But they didn't say like, boy, is this a well edited show, right? They said, they said, check out the chemistry. So fair enough. Fair enough. But don't get me wrong. I, um, I have always thought your editing is exceptional because I know what the raw <laughs> content of the <laughs> well, show sounds and like. And now everyone else does too. <laughs> I think we're actually a little better than like knowing that there is no safety net. Yeah. I think we're a little better than nights where we've, um, <laughs> We've we just completely lost like we the haven't whole had thread any, of the like, show. Beefness style events or anything. We've at least managed to keep on the conversation mostly. Yeah, then the beefness night almost ended a whole show. Like we, I, <laughs> beefness we, night, there almost wasn't a show. Yeah, I mean, we would have just posted just the hysterical laughter, <laughs> right? I mean, we did because you got the we, bonus. I did anyway. Seven. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Anyway, that would have been the whole show. Anyway, um, bringing us back <laughs> to topic, uh, let us. Let us talk about what's giving us life in gaming. Senda, what's giving you life in gaming this week? So I hope I didn't talk about this already. Um, and if I did, please forgive me. So the, the game that I am now um, into with my uh, bi-weekly game group of awesome peeps is uh, Cartel. By Magpie Games. By Magpie Games. It's a fantastic game. Um, and it is, it's really interesting to me, right? Because the the actual genre of the game, and I think we've talked about this before, isn't necessarily one that I would have been like, ooh, I must have this. No, um, it, the irony that you're playing Cartel before and you're not. I'm yes. playing Cartel. It's, it, the irony is strong. The irony is strong. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yes. But the reason that I was really excited about this game and extremely delighted to be playing it is because um, in in after the fashion of many Powered by the Apocalypse games, it has very strong, fantastic, complicated relationship building. And we is, have... 
Which is your jam. It's sort of my jam. It is completely my jam. And we built a a supremely complicated, messy, terrible system of people who are basically like there's 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 no way that everybody comes out of this okay, right? Like, just from the relationships, before we even add all the outside pressure of, like, running a cartel and everything, it was already screwed from the get-go. It was dead on arrival. And that is delightful to me, because now what we have going on is um, a very complicated web of relationships, totally my jam, and a very complicated web of outside influences... Um, that are pushing against all of us in different ways um, and forcing us to <laughs> mess with those relationships um, and try to lean on them or pull on them or um, have to make difficult decisions about which relationships we maintain and which ones we don't, etc. Which is the whole purpose of having those relationships means that when you make the decisions in game, they're difficult decisions, right? I mean... <sighs> I mean, that, I think that's the the hallmark if we're talking about what makes good drama, right? Yes. It's it's having to make difficult decisions that um, are non optimal, right? Where there's yeah. where there's no good there's no good choice. There's no and good choices. There's no good choice, and the struggle of which ones you're going to make, and the consequences of said um, actions, I think, is where uh, the real uh, the real drama in those kinds of games uh, lie. Now, I will tell you, having played uh, one of the, I don't want to say early, I played the Ashcan yep. version of the game yep. and ran it for like a four session arc. And um, I can also tell you <laughs> that not everyone in my game uh, lived. Um, some of them did not live based on uh, NPCs. Uh -huh. Some of them did not live based on PCs. Right, um, we we already had a little encounter where the you got fucking shot move came up already, and this was this was session two, um, and but, but somebody aced that role, right? Yeah, he did. He killed it. Was that when? It was when, and so he has a stylish like a you know a. A, a, like a cool a, scar. A cool scar kind of yeah. situation happening. Yeah. Got shot by the woman he slept with the night before. Nice. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, listen, th listen, that move is not to be messed with. Like, there's no. a reason why that move is named that way. Uh huh. Uh, and the if you roll low, like, it's you, bad. You're dead. You're just dead. I have a black and white uh, ink drawing of um, the death of our cartel character. Uh, hanging up in my game room. It's just on the opposite side of this camera. I've uh, seen it. Yeah, a piece it's called great. The Death of Soledad. Yeah. Um, who uh, who did not um, make her make role. Yeah. I, uh, I was like, wow, are we about to lose this really major NPC who's tied into all of this stuff in session two? <laughs> because to be clear, when is my husband my much older husband's child by a previous wife oh i didn't realize he's the stepson and he's a federale <laughs> right see again <laughs> when we talk about when we talk about um when we talk about when we talk about bad decisions, right, or no <laughs> is, optimal is decision, a bad. There's no right? good decision. But there's here. also there's also chemistry between you two, right? Uh huh. So now it's chemistry between. So first of all, it's your. It's like your estranged se stepson. Yeah, I literally hadn't met him until right. he showed up at the beginning of this game, and I didn't know who he was when he walked yeah. into the scene first. And then um, he's got his own like so you've got you've got the um you've got the narco husband yes the federale stepson yes. right love love like fledgling love triangle yes uh, oh, when's oh, got wait, wait 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 so but also I'm actually having an affair with the rat Oh yes okay not the animal the rat no. for people who don't know the rat is the one rat of the playbooks. playbook. Yes, I'm actually having an affair with her, um, and my old flame is the cook 
who runs my taco truck, which until just a few days ago, I thought was a charity taco truck and just found out that my husband is using it to deal drugs around town. So can I clarify something? Yes. (laughs) Is literally every character in this game somebody you are sleeping with, have slept with, or are going to sleep with? All but one. (laughs) I mean, what's the deal on that one? Um, he's, he's sort of one of those, like, precious idiots. Like, okay, here's the thing. I'm not barring the fact that I might at some point, but if I sleep with him, it will be a character manipulation tactic. I mean, mean, I'm shrugging here, right? Completely possible. I took the move that gives me good things if I sleep with people. Okay, I'm just saying, like, I'm just saying I, I feel like you will have... Not really accomplished everything in the campaign. <laughs> if you, if if you haven't, <laughs> yes, check all the boxes before you're done. I'm gonna work on it. I'm, so far, so far, one down. What do we got? Like five to go. <laughs> so you know, when this whole thing goes up in flames, you're gonna wind up in a drum. In the desert. In the dead. desert, right? Yeah. Yes, I really do. In fact, um, so Wen's character, the Federale is in town investigating me because of my charity food truck because he thinks that I'm the narco and it won't believe that his father could possibly be involved. And ha- he, when <laughs> now my husband, his father, has noticed like all of, all of, there's like DEA coming in town and stuff, right? And like shit's going down quickly. And so he's decided that it's my taco truck and he's just going to pin it all on me. Delightfully <laughs> messy. It's super messy. Anyway, that's my game. So that's giving me life because it's phenomenally I can tell. messy. I can tell. Difficult. Based on I know, gaming story. It's so sorry, all. It's no, but based on your right. description, it's, it's clear <laughs> that you are... Um, I'm really loving the like horrible, messy relationship disaster i mean it is just it was a walking disaster from day one and i'm thrilled it's awesome yeah yep cool yeah anyway what's giving you life in in your game life what are you doing game wise yeah so you know i had this icon game icons game that was going and um there wasn't anything actually wrong with it but it wasn't giving me life it wasn't giving the players who were playing it who were playing it either. Like we had a good time setting it up. We played a few sessions of it. We liked it, but you know the difference between a game that's like good and a game that like you're craving to play, right? Yes. Have that's I mentioned where cartel I, recently? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's where I was, right? So, and it turned out so was my group, which is always almost always a sign that when I feel like that, I'm not the only one in my group who feels like that. So. Having hashed it out with my players, um, we spent a session online uh, kicking around ideas for games. And it's kind of interesting because pandemic-wise, games that I would have normally put on my go-to list, I like. we were all like, eh. Like, yeah. we were looking at, um, before pandemic, we were looking at... Um, Headspace, right? Yeah, we were looking at that. But before that, we were even looking at, like, Bite Me, Bite Marks. Bite marks, yeah. I will always call it by the original name. Sorry. I know. But I mean, we were looking at like bite marks, but then it was like, ooh, that seems a little too intense right now. So anyway, we kind of went around this list of different games and settled in on Numenera. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, I was like, I didn't know you guys wanted to play Numenera. Like, I will totally run Numenera. Like, I think that's, I- I've always found that game interesting i backed i was like one of the original i was in the original kickstarter group right like i i was there at gen con when Monty announced it i threw my money right at it Mm -hmm. um i have you know the first edition copy um when you know when the game came out and and i and i in all honesty um i love Monty cook games as a company i love Monty, shauna all of them like i love i love um all of the people there i think they're fantastic uh, people so when it came around to like, hey, let's play Numenera, I was like, cool. I'm like, I will totally run Numenera. I'm like, this is a very big game book. Like, I haven't run a game that's in an eight and a half by 11 format, let alone 
let alone 400 pages of, of game. Yeah. And I was like, woo. I'm like, now, as soon as I posted that on Twitter, people were like, but Phil, don't worry. The rules of the game are actually small. There's just a lot of options and other stuff in there. And I was like, all right. I mean, I play DCC. Like, that's another game that years ago I, you know, read and learned. And it's, you know, it looks worse than it is. So I was like, cool. I, I'm going I'm to run Numenera. And then I like really got into the idea of it, right? So I started I started thinking about it and I was like, oh yeah, yeah, no, I'm one. There's a lot of things about this game that really appealed to me. So uh it it's science fantasy, which I like over fantasy. Yeah. Because as you know You don't and like magic. I don't want to disparage anyone who loves magic. I yeah. do not love magic, right? Yeah, I know. Um I'm a science kid. I was a Star Trek. I was a Star Trek before Star Wars kid. I was a sci-fi kid before I was a fantasy kid. Like, I, I like me some sci-fi. So I love Monty's premise that, like, you know, this is the ninth world and eight other civilizations have come and gone and have reached all sorts of unbelievable potentials at their heights before they disappeared. And so, you know, things like, you know, uh, portable singularities and whatever, like all of these things exist. And now they look like magic. And I'm like, Oh, check I'm in. Like I can have magic stuff, but not have it be magic. It's very Andre Norton. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I was like, I'm, I'm totally down with this because back when I first, um, back when we first got the game, I made my first character. Uh, and this is years and years ago, Chris was running a game of Numenera and I made this character and, um, I made this setting called Gasalt Mountain, which is basically, it used to be a city until somebody detonated a um, single point black hole in the center of it. And it basically sucked the entire city into just a mountain, like the shape of, so it's not really a mountain. It's just that over time it looks like a mountain, but like when you climb it and you dig into it, it's like, it's like a city all crushed back together. It's very, so I was like, it's very Kipo and the Wonder Beast. A little bit, right? Yeah. It, so I was like, okay, well, I'm bringing Gasalt Mountain back. That's going to be part yeah. of my d default setting. Yeah. But then the other thing struck me because mm -hmm. I was starting to think about the game and they're like, now imagine it's at about a medieval level world. And I was like, okay. I was like, cool. This was a little something that we had talked about, I think, on Misdirected Mark when we were talking about um, comfort zones and things like that. And I started to think, I was like, oh, I'm like, right, I, I need, there are a bunch of things I need to combat as I put this game together, which is falling into this um, Western European uh, default medieval uh, description, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like this is the ninth world. No, it's a billion years in the future. No rules. No rules from this world apply. Right. So then I was like, okay. So one, I, I, we're going to use the word humans, but humans aren't really going to be like like they don't look a hundred percent like our humans, right? Because it's a billion years in the future. But we're going to call them humans. And I'm like, okay, cool, because we can do some stuff with that, um, which is great because it means that um, what humans look like can even be a thing we can discuss right? Um, as, part of, as part of our session zero. Yeah, yeah. And then the other part was I was like, oh, I'm queering this shit up. Yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> I was like... Because, because, you know, again, that comfort, that, that comfort level default is like, oh, right, like, there's hetero married couples, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, we, we can just throw this, like, just ripping this shit, right? Like, we can just, I mean, there'll be some hetero married couples, because that's fine, but there's going to be a whole bunch of not hetero, you know, couples mixed into this thing, too. And then I remembered Shauna Germain wrote, like, a uh, whole PDF about this, uh, about, um, about, relationships and things in the, in the ninth world. And I was like, Oh, I have it. Like I quick got it off my file server and I'm like, Oh, we're going to be like this. As soon as I finish the Numenera book, I'm reading this, like I'm reading this PDF. Like, nice. And it's a thing that I just, I really want to, I just want to take advantage of the fact that like you're, you're free. Like it's science fantasy without 
necessarily being bound to the conventions of Western fantasy. Yeah. And I don't know exactly what that means. Yeah. But I mean to write it on an index card and stick it in front of me when I'm both prepping and running the game. Like as a reminder, like, like anytime you think you're just taking the, you know, the safe route. Yep. You need to knock Go that harder. shit off. Yeah. Right. Like Do you're better. just being, yeah, you're just being lazy. Like just, just work it a little, like work it a little bit more, take it a little bit past that. And I'm excited for that. And then I was reading the system and I'm like, oh yeah, this system's completely light. Like it's super light. And I was like, oh, I'll have no problem running the system. Um, which one, it does something very smartly. It pushes most of the system on the players. Like I have very little I have to actually do other than tell a cool story and occasionally pick some difficulty levels for things. Um, the players have to manage their resources and roll dice and shit like that. Um, so I, I like that. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm excited. This It's giving me life. Like I'm excited to... Uh, I'm excited to uh, read a new game. I'm excited about um, I'm excited about running something new. Uh, I got my other two games going. Right? I got my DCC game going, and I got my Forbidden Lands game, which is just like eternal now, right? Like that game's just going to run for. Uh, it's turned for a very into long time. that old style of like there is no endpoint game, hasn't it? It actually does have an endpoint. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm playing a particular campaign. Book Fair that enough. has an endpoint. Has an endpoint. Um, but at the rate at which we move through storyline, you may never get there. I don't know if we'll ever actually get to the end. End. Like there are a lot of intermediate goals in the middle of this thing. We may someday just get to an intermediate goal and be like, "Cool, let's We're <laughs> let's done. not play anymore." Right. But for now, that game's like that game's going. But anyway, I'm I the thing that's giving me life is. Uh, a renewed interest in uh, in playing a game. I haven't been excited about. Um, I haven't been. I haven't had new game excitement in a while, and I'm definitely having new game excitement. So, which is awesome. I've been finding um, for a while there, just pandemic wise, the games that were giving me excitement. And I know that I talked about this probably here and definitely on the Gnomecast. Um, as I was getting new game excitement from games that were specifically built to play online. So that was an interesting, like, mm-hmm. twist on it, right? Um, and then, but, like, just to piggyback for a moment, like, um, I got to play Dead Friend, finally. Um, yeah. Which is by Lucian Khan, and it's uh, a great game. And uh, I played it with Wen, and I recorded it. So if you want to hear it, you can hear it on She's a Super Geek. Um, and, uh, but it was like, it was one of those weird, like, I've been talking about it and hearing about it for so long and then when i opened it um i was like oh this is neat like it's got like a a ritual page and all of this stuff and i was like i'm totally into this um i'm still right now getting my new game life energy from like physical components which is tricky because everything's online right now fun yeah, I'm, uh, what you call it? I'm actually, so, uh, the other thing that I'm dealing with as I'm working on this game is I'm like, okay, what digital assets yeah. do I have? Now, as it turns out, Numenera has a bunch. Like, Roll20 has a whole bunch of Numenera um, stuff cooked in. So, there's a nice character sheet, which I'm like, oh, that's great. Um, because I think it, I think it does, I think it does rolling and stuff for you and all the pool management. Um, there are um, the physical game. You can buy decks of cards for ciphers and things like that. So that like you can randomly pull out a cipher and hand it to a player. Yeah. Um, so the cool part is they have those decks digitized. Ooh, there's been lots of stuff translated to, to uh, Roll20 recently. That's really cool. Did you, so like Fall of Magic, you can play on Roll20 now? I don't think that's new. I think well, it's been there for a little while. Okay, I mean, that makes sense, but I didn't know about it. And maybe I'll yes. actually get to play it someday? Uh, I would love... I still have never played this game? I know. I, I, I'm torn. I'm torn. I'm, I'm. Here's what I'm torn about. Yes. I'm torn about playing it online with you because, one, I want to play this game with you because I think you're going to love it. Yes. But, two... It's so tactile. 
it's beautiful. Yeah. It's a piece of, it's a piece of, you're playing a game on a piece of artwork. Yes. And I own the game. And so if we are just patient and, and ride out the pandemic. I'm not always known for my patience, but sure. <laughs> but there's a, there's a point where we could play it somewhere. Yes. Um, because I have, right. Because I have it and I have all the stuff for it. Like I ha- I backed both of the other Kickstarters for it. I have the really nice, um, I have the extra coin and all that stuff. So I, I am torn because I know you will love this game if you play it. But also, I think that if you, I think that there's a lot to be said for, um, there's a lot to be said for putting down the map and yeah. unrolling it as part of the game process. It's fair enough that it's, it, yes. And I, I actually agree with you. But I, so I will also say, though, just because I know these ones, just in case people don't know this, um, the new version of Fiasco with the card decks is also available. You can buy it on Roll20 and also For the Queen is available on Roll20. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which is super uh, neat. Like, you can just literally be like the same way that we would just grab a bunch of people together to play, like, at a convention or something. Be like, hey, you want to play some For the Queen for like an hour? Sure. You can do that on Roll 20. I'm waiting for my fiasco to arrive. I have the digital assets because I was a backer of the thing, but I, uh, I'm still waiting for my shipping confirmation. Don't, yes, don't well, do it. I mine know. Mine is on the shelf over here. <laughs> Yours is a prototype, which is even That's, cooler. I know. Andy has the real one. Yeah. I'm waiting for mine. I have not gotten the ship, shipping notification. <laughs> anyway, we should move on to um, yeah. other things that are giving us life outside of games, and that is food. Yeah, apparently what, it's all food. <laughs> what is, what's giving you life? So let me just start by saying, firstly, because I've talked about bread a lot, I have discovered that my bread recipe translates really well to baguettes, and um, I'm a big fan of this because it's just a better, um, it's a better shape thing for like functional use for baguettes are amazing I sandwiches and breakfast and, and 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 breaking chunks off and like all of those things right so um and i've perfected it it's a it's a very loose dough so it's hard for me to necessarily get it to rise to a perfect baguette and not be flat if i just put it in the oven but i uh, made my father bring me down baguette pans which is just like a little u-shaped thing sure, sure. and in that uh perfection they came out beautifully um just a little bit of help right so like it's close i mean i'm not gonna i'm not gonna pretend that this is a true french baguette but it is probably as close as i'm going to come especially at 5200 feet above sea level um yeah i was gonna say you're uh what you call it i was gonna say you're doing this whole thing um (laughs) you know in the sky right which makes a very large difference and I have struggled down this path before. But anyway, so so that's the first thing. The first thing is, like, bread continues. The bread continues. Um, the bread knows all. But the other thing that I tried this weekend with my kiddo, and I'm very excited about, is no-churn homemade ice cream. And it is so freaking good. And the base of this ice cream, it's in... Bon Appetit, of course. Um, so, like, you can spend a lot of money getting, you know, three cups of raspberries to do a raspberry swirl and, you know, schmancy chocolate and fresh mint to infuse your cream and yada, 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 right? But but the basis of this ice cream is so unbelievably easy and it's such a just an easy palette that you could really just do whatever you wanted on that I'm thrilled to pieces to just start experimenting, right? So it's a cup of condensed, or no, it's a can of condensed milk, a teaspoon of kosher salt, and mm-hmm. then um, a pint of heavy whipping cream whipped, right? Mm-hmm. Meaning you have to buy heavy whipping cream because you need it to be not unsweetened because the only sugar in this situation is the condensed milk. So It's my favorite cream. Uh, yeah. Whipped cream? Heavily whipped. Wow. Okay. You know I'm not editing this, right? Anyway... <laughs> I, I knew it when I said it. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> so you whip the cream. What? No comment now. Okay, so you you whip the cream, <laughs> and I, I can't take you, every joke. Like you can't, we can't then, hit every one of them. Go ahead. You, make make ice cream here. Tell me about making ice you cream. You whip the cream. You fold it um, into 
the uh, the condensed milk um, and the salt with like so what I did was you know we did the chocolate one and so I added I think it was like a, a quarter cup of cocoa powder or something and you just fold it all in together until it's all mixed and then you put it in a loaf pan and you stick it in the freezer for eight hours that's it that's it and then the only trick to it is because it's homemade ice cream and you didn't churn it, you have to put it in the refrigerator for about 10 minutes before you want to eat it so that it's soft enough for you to serve it. It is phenomenal. It's so good and it's so easy. I was like, wow, I'm blown away. So And it was delicious? It's delicious. So I we went slightly schmancy in that I didn't go buy fresh mint leaves to infuse the cream. So I left the mint out of this chocolate recipe. But I did do the part where you layer the chocolate um, base into the pan and then you drizzle it with like bittersweet chocolate and then you layer more on and then you drizzle bittersweet chocolate so that there's like layers of like chocolatey chunks inside the ice cream as you scoop it. But I could totally see doing things like if you wanted it to be chocolate with like a caramel swirl, you could do that. You could just like buy some caramel or whatever. You could just buy some fudge sauce and just like swirl it into the ice cream and then freeze it. And that's it. Like you're good. Anyway, it was very exciting. And then for dinner tonight, I made a schmancy ramen salad thing, which was also exciting. But um, mostly I'm excited about the ice cream. Anyway, Phil, what's your food thing? Chicken katsu. <laughs> I'm so jealous of this Dunbury place. Oh, I love this place. Uh, so, down the road from my house, um, there is um, there's this little place. I honestly overlooked it like a bunch of times. Um, I did not think it was the... Um, is it, I don't want to say it's a hole in the wall. It's just this little restaurant. I overlooked it. One of the other guys in my group pointed it out. And I was like, I'm like, oh, so like this place is a Japanese yakitori dambori place. And I was like, all right, I'm in. Because I don't know if you remember. I think we talked about it a while ago. I was really into, um, I was really into this YouTube guy who lives in Japan. Yes. His name's Pablo. Oh, I remember. Oh, okay. I, I remember. So I, I, I watch so many of Pablo's videos, right? Yes. I forget his. I forget the name of his channel, but it, um, it, it's, Pablo from Tokyo, I think, is actually yes, the name. I, I don't think it's actually that complicated. Yeah. But his favorite meal is um, chicken katsu curry. And for the longest time, I was like, I have got to try this meal. All right. So if you don't know what chicken katsu is, uh, it's pretty simple. So uh, chicken katsu is basically uh just a fried chicken cutlet and it's um it's it's a um a chicken breast cutlet pounded down flat um i'm pretty sure it's coated in panko based mm -hmm. on the crunch of it it's panko deep fried and then typically cut into just slices right you just you just quick slice across it um if and i could be wrong on this but i think i understand enough of this from watching the videos um so dambori is a uh, style. It's it basically a rice bowl. Yeah, rice bowls. So it, so it is a bunch of rice, and their rice is delicious. Like I really love their rice. Um, you lay the chicken katsu on top of it, garnish it with like a little bit of broccoli and some ginger, which I largely just ignore. Um, what? Give me your ginger. Oh, it's fine. I, it's pickled ginger, no. and it, it would be fine. But I don't um, really nom, need it for nom, the palate cleanser. I don't need it for the palate cleanser. I love the ginger. Give me the ginger. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so for the for the chicken katsu curry, um, then what you get is a little container of a Japanese curry sauce, brown sauce curry, with little bits of um, potato and carrot in it. Um, and then I try, I, I usually just dump it right on top. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't dip or anything like that. I just dump it on top because I want the curry sauce to get into the rice. Um, it. I will say this, though. It does soften the the, the panko crunch. So, um, I'm you know, I don't always dump it all the way in. Sometimes I just dump it on part of it, eat the first part, then dump it, you know, like put some sauce on the next part, that kind of thing. Because I don't want the panko getting all um, smooshy. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so the other bowl that they make is, um, the other bowl they make is just a chicken katsu bowl, which instead of the curry sauce, they give you this, um, 
this like thicker teriyaki sauce. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's actually teriyaki sauce, but it's a brown sauce. It's a little sour. Okay. Um, but I find it to be delicious as well. And you can just drizzle that onto the uh, chicken and a little onto the rice, whatever. Anyway, it's not a super complicated meal. It is excellent though. Like I just, I love it. This place makes it, it's not even, it's not that expensive and it's like a couple blocks from my house. Uh, and so far I've done the chicken katsu curry. I've done the chicken katsu. And then there's also a pork uh, katsu and a pork katsu curry. Uh, and at some point I will probably try to get around uh, to that one as well. But I really, like, I really love it. It's, um, it's really good. <laughs> so I, this will sound silly, but uh, when I get it, the bowl that the container that they put it in is always like too small to pour the curry mm -hmm. sauce into. Yeah. So I want to put it into like a larger bowl. And what's really nice is that their rice is so sticky that if I just get a fork under the rice, just, I can oof. actually, I can basically slide the container out and basically just slide the whole thing into a larger bowl <laughs> and then just take the bowl to the table and, you know, put the sauce in it and eat it without ruining the presentation. Cause I, I do find, I don't say this for all foods, but I, I find for Japanese food that um, presentation is is a big part of eating it. Um, and they do such a nice job of the way the katsu is like perfectly cut and laying on top of everything and then garnished just so. And it's really nice to be able to get it out of that container without it just like falling apart into like a mixture of rice and chicken. You know, like, I don't know. I've, I don't know if that sounds silly. No, it, you're talking to the person who just made ramen salad tonight and very carefully arranged all of the vegetables on top of that ramen. I and then thought your ramen salads the looked... the entire thing with dressing. Yeah, I thought they looked very nice. Um, they were delicious. Yeah, so, I, so anyway, chicken katsu has been giving me life. I've had it now a couple times. Um... And I just like, I'm really pleased that this place exists and I keep wanting to just like, here, take my money. Don't go out of business. Like, I really need you to be around. <gasps> I just what? remembered something else food wise that's giving me life, but I'm going to let you finish first. Uh, no, I was just about to loop it back around. So, um, okay. Well, I want to say one more thing about food sure, that's giving me sure, life. Sure. And then I'll maybe regret it next week when I don't have something to talk about potentially. I don't know. It's okay. fine. I want to let you all know that. I got, you know, super excited at the beginning of the pandemic and was like, I'm going to garden again. And then I was like, I forgot about my garden. And I like didn't weed it for like a month. And then I went out and weeded it and like it was fine. And I don't know, stuff grew and didn't grow and whatever. And I mostly just have been ignoring it. But I have my first tomato and there are many more on their way, which is thrilling. But the raspberry bushes, which... I mostly just ignore except the ones that I mow over because the raspberries are trying to take over my entire yard. And they have been for years. The raspberry bushes this year have gone mad. And it's delightful. I'm not buying raspberries. I just go out every couple of days and I fill up a whole container with raspberries. And they're so good. That's and I awesome. I grew them myself. I love them. There is something so satisfying about food that you grew yourself. And it's kind of just amazing that you can. Like, we don't cool. think about it very often because there's grocery stores, right? But, like, wow, it's really cool to be like, this is delicious, and I grew it. I love it. I think it's awesome. And I saw the picture of everything that you harvested, and uh, and it was it looked great. It was a lot of raspberries. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Anyway. So what do you think? I think we've reached the uh, end of our chit chat. Yeah, I think we're probably in a good place to wrap this up. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so then uh, before we kick into the closing, uh, first you need to tell us about another show on the Mistracted Mark Network. Sure. On uh, She's a Super Geek, you can catch me and Andy uh, every other week uh, doing actual play RPGs that highlight women as GMs or sometimes, as in the recent past, there is no GM. And so that's just fun because, you know, we all enjoy it. Anyway... You should check it out. I ended up playing a couple of two-person games recently that were very epic, and I enjoyed them. And uh, part two of Dead Friend will be coming out, I think, the day after this episode drops. Yes. Excellent. Good. Excellent, excellent. That's my... Cool. My Say, Senda. Yes. 
Where do people find us on the internet? Well, you can find us on Twitter at Pandas Talk Games. You can find us in the Misdirected Forums, which is forums.misdirectedmark.com, or you can drop us an email, panda at misdirectedmark.com. And Phil, once they find us in one of those locations, what can they do with that information? Yeah, absolutely. Ask us a question. Uh, give us a suggestion for a show topic. Something you want to know while we're chit-chatting. Whatever. It's okay. Um, we'll make a show out of it. Like I said, we've been doing chit-chat episodes, but occasionally we've just been pulling things out of the new request, uh, new requests and just doing them as free-form episodes where I just uh, toss out the topic and we just go back and forth discussing it, which I've thoroughly enjoyed yeah, um, doing fun. as a little break from the chit-chats. Mm -hmm. And I would, um, we're probably going to do more of those. So uh, please give us topics. We actually really love doing the show uh, talking about the things in gaming that you find interesting. And because, uh, again, we'll sit around and talk about uh, homemade homemade raspberries <laughs> um, and, you know, Japanese cuisine, as well as the ditch lilies all day. Uh, but if you ask us to talk about a thing, we will happily uh, do that instead. So we really want to do that. And uh, we pride ourselves. Pre-pandemic, we were like 98% uh, topic driven from from our listeners during pandemic we're probably like 94 percent. we've been doing a lot of our own um, oh to chats and Gosh, things sorry. like that and we'll, we'll bring those numbers back up po like when we get through the other side of this but yes. for now give us some suggestions if you like what we do here elsewhere on the misdirected mark network please consider supporting our patreon campaign go to patreon.com slash mmp uh your patronage is what keeps uh everything uh, going. Um, bandwidth, hosting costs, um, equipment for hosts, all that stuff. Um, it's not a small amount of uh, material, and it means a lot to us to uh, be able to um, do all of this uh, for you guys to listen to. We love doing it, but uh, it wouldn't be half as much fun if we were doing it and you guys weren't listening. So uh, please consider... <laughs> It's true. Yes. Please consider supporting a <laughs> Patreon campaign if you can. Um, we know these are trying times, so if you can't, please don't even don't even don't even worry about it. Um, but if you do become a patron of uh, Mr. Dr. Mark, there are a bunch of things you get. You get first of all, you get access to the Slack Room for Life. It is a wonderful collection of humans uh, that uh, I hang out with uh, quite frequently, and we just kind of talk about our days. Uh, we have uh, Friday Lunch Club where we all get together online. And uh, just, you know, chit chat about how um, our weeks are going in lockdown, things like that. Um, we have the bonus outtakes from this show, which are pretty damn funny, actually. <laughs> um, we're, we're pretty delightful. Um, so you get those. You get the, um, the after show from Destructive Mark. Uh, there are other stuff that um, when we're not in pandemic lockdown that we also uh, like to do for our listeners. We've in the past, we've done things like parody songs and um, publications from encoded designs and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, so uh, we very much um, like to shower those things upon our patrons as well. So please, if you can uh, consider supporting the Patreon campaign, uh, it means a great deal to us. Uh, so thank you. There is a thing you can do if you're already supporting the Patreon campaign, which again, thank you. And if you are unable to support the Patreon campaign, um, that helps us immensely. And it falls into our, our devious trap of if you listen to us, you will love us. <laughs> we know this to be true, uh -huh. right? If you listen to <laughs> us, you will love us. But we need to get more people to listen to us. So... Other than just putting our recording in front of other gamers and being like, listen to this, it's awesome. There's another thing you can do that helps gamers that gamers and podcast listeners that you don't know uh -huh. find us. Uh -huh. And all you got to do is uh, go to a place called Apple Podcasts mm -hmm. um, or a couple other places, which Senda's is going to tell you about. And then you're going to do a thing. Right. So send a... What's the thing? Well, you can leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or the podcatcher of your choice. Um, every new review we get really does actually help new people find the show. And uh, so I will just call out, I think this is our most recent one. Um, Eric Clusta, thanks so much for the review. You're awesome. We appreciate oh, it. Oh, sweet. <laughs> I didn't know we had a new review. Thank you. <laughs> I know. We, we, we stopped doing the new review dance when you got in trouble at work. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, 
Yes. Well, <laughs> that happened. It did happen. Anyway, so uh, thank you so much to everyone who already has left a review. They really do actually help new people find the show, and we super appreciate them. And also, artistic validation. Yay! No, we love artistic validation. <laughs> like, that's, let's just be clear. We love artistic love validation. We love artistic validation. It's great. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, say, Senda, uh, what are you going to make with all those delicious raspberries? Um, I, right now, I'm just eating. This show is a joint production of She's a Super Geek and Misdirected Mark Productions, the media arm of Encoded Designs. Bloopy! Clicky. A new fragrance by Calvin Klein. Oh dear, what does it smell like? Podcasters in hot rooms? Wow. <laughs> It's not cool in this room right now. My air conditioner has not kicked on, and this particular room tends to get warmer and warmer. Why is that? I don't know. But see, once it kicks on, then I'll be cold. Because I need a vent magnetic. That's the whole... Is it obsession? No. No. It's, it's vent magnetic. It's clicky. Click A. Click A from Paris. Click A. Click A. From Paris. <laughs> new fragrance. Oh, oh do misdirected Mark. <laughs> Bloop. All right. It's time to record I, the show. <laughs> it's time to record the show. <laughs> it's time to talk those games. It's time to get things started on the Panda Show tonight. Boom, boom, boom. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah. Please, God, take us in. Wait, let me give us a ten count. Bloop. <laughs> bum, bum. bum. <laughs> 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 <laughs>